everyone. Welcome to today's um, or today's first, our third Admitted Student Week virtual session. We are excited to have you all um, joining us this afternoon um, to learn a little bit more about the field team and the field process. Um, for those who may be new to the virtual week, um, I'll start with a quick round of introductions. My name is Aaliyah McKessie. I'm one of the assistant directors of admissions. I use she, her pronouns. Um, also, I'm an alum of the program, so have, have been where you've, you're at um, and, and all the different sides of it. Um, Emma Toomey is also here from admissions, our admissions specialist. We will be in the chat if there are any questions that we can answer as we go through or just moderating and sharing those questions either as they come or at the end of the session as well. Um, with that being said, I will turn it over. We have our field team here. Um, I will turn over to Mel to get us started. Thanks, Aaliyah. Thanks, Emma. Appreciate you all uh, for having us today. Good to see everybody. Uh, welcome. Welcome to Crown. Uh, we're excited to work with you. We're excited to have you. My name is Mel LaMagna, and I am the director of field education here at Crown. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm also uh, an alum of the program, just like Aaliyah. Um, I graduated in 2003, so just like Aaliyah said, been through the same process that you're about to embark on uh, when you start here at Crown. We're going to talk about field today. We're really excited because we know you're excited and we know you're anxious about what um, field placement and internship looks like for you. So we'll cover a lot of ground today and then we're going to really open it up and have some Q&A because that's where we can get some of the best dialogue and discussion about some, some things. So why don't we go ahead and introduce the rest of the team that's on the screen today uh, so that you get to know the players. Uh, let me pass it to you, Susan. Hello, hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Susan Klumpner. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Associate Director of Field Education here at the Crown Family School. Uh, like Mel, um, I graduated from the Crown School in 2011. Lots of us um, are alums on this call. Um, and so definitely uh, know exactly sort of where you're sitting at right now um, as you really are starting your process here um, and making the decision, right, um, on whether or not this program uh, fits your learning needs. Uh, I formerly was a school social worker, so that was kind of the pathway that I chose at Crown. Um, and I, I currently am still in youth development as a practitioner, too. So really great, great to meet y'all. And I'll pass it over to my colleague, Melissa. Hi, everybody. My name is Melissa Williams. I use she, her pronouns, and I am one of the field coordinators here in the field education office. Um, what else can I say? So I'm not an alum of Crown, but I did get my MSW. I'm a licensed social worker. And so just like Susan said, I've been through this process. I had um, two field placements of my own, and I know how critical they, they were for my learning at that time. And so I'm super excited to be here to talk to you all. And I've actually had the opportunity to meet some of you all that are already um, have accepted your offer as a advanced standing student. So great to see you all here. And also, I'll pass it along to Michael. Thanks, Melissa. Hi, folks. Uh, Michael Williams. I am the Extended Evening Program Coordinator. Uh, he, him pronouns. Uh, I graduated from Crown in 2010. Uh, specialization was working with children and families, and I worked in residential treatment for about 15 years before joining the Crown team um, as a coordinator and also a field consultant for first year EVP students. And so, um, really excited to work with uh, folks next year. Thanks, Mel. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, Melissa. And Aaliyah. And Emma. <laughs> <laughs> That's the team on the screen today, folks. And then we have a couple more on the team that we'll introduce, uh, let you know about a little bit in a little bit, um, including all of our field consultants who um, I'll tell you a little bit more about sort of that uh, group of folks who are supporting you all in field. We're really proud of this team being um, all clinicians, being all alums of the school, with the exception of one. We'll give the exception to Melissa for sure. But, um, and again, being able to uh, sort of walk the same path that you're gonna be able to walk on and um, and really be dedicated to field. So what we're proud of with this program is not just sort of the deep bench of clinical skills, macro skills that we have experienced firsthand, but also uh, just being able to um, be dedicated to this, this aspect of your uh, journey here uh, at Crown. Um, we don't have any other, um, assignments or teaching classes or anything like that. We just dedicate ourselves to field. 
Um, and field is going to be one of the most important aspects of your learning here at Crown, for sure. We all have that same experience and same sort of takeaways from our time here at the school of being able to network with uh, all of our field supervisors that we've had um, and throughout our internships and who have connected us to uh, many jobs and many opportunities throughout our career. Uh, so it's such a lasting relationship that you're going to have um, with the folks that you meet at field placement. Our relationship with community providers all over the state and the surrounding neighborhoods is really robust as well. And that's what we really pride ourselves in our in, in too, is just sort of the relationships that we've developed with all of the different types of field placements and organizations and hospitals and schools that we'll talk to you a little bit about today. Um, all of those relationships are so key to making sure that our students have opportunities in the areas that they want to seek. And we extend that by having such a wide range of uh, organizations and opportunities for our students, whether it's in direct, pal direct practice or policy or macro applications. We also look beyond what is typical in social work, whether it's case management or doing clinical work or doing policy work in social work. We're also impacting other industries, whether it's within business corporations or even in the creative arts. We just really extend our reach when it comes to placement because we want students to have choice and opportunity that's going to match and align with their goals. So we're proud to represent many of those um, grassroots organizations to nationwide organizations whose mission toward uh, creating a, a just society aligned with our same goals and mission here at the school. So we'll try to cover some of that ground today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about who we are. We'll talk about, you're gonna hear all of the field terminology that we use. So we encourage you to ask some questions if you need some clarification, because there are a lot of players, both at the school and at the organization and the community. Um, and we wanna make sure you have those terminologies um, straightened out. We'll talk about our matching process for first year placement, which you're probably anxious about and wanting to learn more about which is how do we assign you for your first year field placement, which that's gonna start in the fall. And then we'll um, we'll cover some more ground as it relates to um, sort of how our, we support students. Um, we'll touch a little bit on the second year field placement process, even though it's not important to you right now. Um, and then again, we'll open it up to Q&A. Um, so why don't we go ahead and open up these slides and um, talk a little bit more about our team because I really wanna get the layout for you in terms of who we are, because you met the players who are on the team here. Um, and then on the next slide, I have, you can see this sort of organizational chart here. Um, what, in addition to the players who are on the screen on the field team, we also have Alice, who's our field project assistant. And Alice is sort of our um, data collector. She is in front of all of the evaluations that students need to complete. She does a lot of behind the scenes work that's really critical to what we're doing. Um, because when it comes to database and data input and collecting information, um, Alice is our go-to person for all of that. Every year we also have a student rep on our team. We do a work study um, that is really important for us to have a student that represents um, field with us because Every time we make a decision or we're trying to plan for um, matching or we're trying to plan for preparation for um, interviewing for field in your second year, we want the student perspective and the student voice in our team. And so we always bring on um, a student uh, to work with us. Um, and this year that's Liz Salinas. And so um, we'll have a new student uh, starting in the fall um, to work on the team that you'll get to meet. And then I touched briefly on the field consultants. And what's um, what's really key about field consultants is that these are crown hired consultants who are LCSWs, MSWs, social workers working in the field and are contracted to provide liaison work, consultation work between you, the student, and the agency. So at the agency are field supervisors they're the ones who are providing the training and the day-to-day -day work um, and oversight for you as an intern. Um, and then the field consultant here at Crown is the person who is going to be your go-to support for all things field. So if there are problem-solving issues, if there are things that are 
um, going well and things that you need to work on or things that the agency has questions about, the field consultant is always that sort of middle person to liaise between um, the agency and you. They also teach seminar, um, which, uh, which is where you uh, go to talk about field, talk about your experiences. Um, that happens on a monthly basis. So field, field consultants are just a really big part of the picture when it comes to our team, even though they're not part of our internal team here um, with the six of us, um, they're contracted out and they're the ones who are really um, walking side by side with you on this journey. Um, and again, uh, why it's so robust and why we feel very proud to have this consultant team um, working with us is because we hire somewhere to 15 to 20 per year. And so by that, we're able to have cohorts, we're able to have, again, more dedicated staff to field to provide the support. Um, so those who are our field consultants are. Um, too many to name, and uh, but you'll get to meet them and you'll get to see uh, who they are when things start in the fall. Field instructors I talked about a little bit, they're the ones who are pr providing the, the, the oversight and the day-to-day -day work and supervision at the field agency. And then next slide, Susan, where are we at? Yeah, so I was just going to add to this slide, as Mel said that, you know, we are obviously really passionate um, and dedicated to field education. And I think what's really important to notice here is that um, Michael, who introduced um, himself as a field coordinator, also is a field consultant. Um, I know that many, if not all of us, have also been field instructors. Um, I currently am a field instructor um, for one of our partner agencies as well. So I think all the way through the way that our field office is structured, um, we're able to kind of see exactly and have sort of like the, the experiences, see and observe the way that our students are actually experiencing the work on the ground. Um, I also, I, I think to that point, you know, many of us, again, went to Crown um, and uh, we're also involved in the matching process. And many of us have returned to Crown it, specifically to work within field education um, because we wanted to improve the matching process. And so we've really landed on something here as a team that um, really ha has been serving, I think, our students well as we started implementing this new process um, within the last couple of years. So how are first year field placement assignments made? Um, so if you're a full-time day um, or an extended evening first year student, uh, you'll be involved in what I've referenced and what Mel has referenced as the matching process. Um, you'll see a, another slide later on that kind of gives you a little bit more information about in terms of the timeline. But um, a field application will be sent to you after you accept admittance, um, after you've accepted your admissions um, in the spring, so late spring, May, June. Um, you'll have access to the field application uh, for, you know, most of the summer. Um, but it's actually quite advantageous for you to complete it kind of as soon as you get it, right? Because as soon as we have your information, which includes like your setting preferences, your population preferences, you know, what anything that you'd like to tell us in terms of your learning objectives, um, we read that application pretty comprehensively. Um, you know, we look at your access to a vehicle, whether or not you're utilizing public transportation. And if you already know where you're going to be living, we absolutely take your address into account um, when we're looking at matching agencies. So why do we match our first year students? And I think, you know, obviously it's been designed to provide support to students entering the field of social work. So the, the agencies that we will match you to um, have specifically agreed to host, mentor, and support first-year students. Um, another huge reason is because a large percentage of our student body is relocating, right? Coming from other locations within, you know, the United States or globally. Um, and, you know, it's, it would be difficult, right? If you had to move to a whole new city um, and 
understand sort of like the nonprofit social service landscape, and then, you know, try to find a field placement agency that aligns exactly within your interests. And that's why we've kind of streamlined this process for y'all. So you're not having to kind of go out there and, and, you know, kind of adjust to so many new variables, right? Starting school. Um, and so when you are completing your field application, um, we cannot stress enough how important it is for y'all to really think about um, the population that you wanna work with or the setting that you wanna be in. Um, because we take that into consideration. Um, that is exactly how we make your match. Um, and I, I say this knowing that, you know, when I was entering uh, the Crown Family School, um, I remember um, being interested in and writing my personal statement in um, supporting survivors of intimate partner violence. And then I was placed in a school. <laughs> um, and it was interesting because, you know, I, I thought that I knew exactly what I, I wanted, but I actually was much more open to a new experience um, than I had indicated within my, my personal statement. And so if you are open to that new experience, please make sure that you put that on your field application, right? Because, you know, you'll be attaching your resume as well. And we're specifically looking not to just replicate other experiences that you've had, but if you are open to us kind of looking at, okay, so you've had some experience in tutoring programs or after school programs, other youth development programs, but you haven't tried a school. Is that something that you're interested in? Or are you interested in taking this first year opportunity as an opportunity, you know, to try hospital setting or um, any anything different, right? Like if you're interested in macro or administration. Um, so yeah, we absolutely read these applications. We meet on a weekly basis as a committee, um, inviting other folks in um, to review these applications along with um, the numerous agencies that we've partnered with um, that are interested in supporting first-year students. Like Susan said, that question is so vital because it gives us a lot of information of who you are, gives us a lot of information for us to work with because as the committee works through the spring and the summer to do our assignments and to do our matching, we're taking into account all of this information. And maybe we're looking at, you know, like uh, Susan said, we're looking at your resumes. We may be making phone calls. We're definitely mapping things out. So we have Google Maps up so that we know where you're living and we know the location of the field placement that we have. And we're working within the parameters and the limitations too. So as, as Susan noted, um, there is a certain pool of uh, our agency partners who are working with first year students this year. Um, and so we'll have an X amount of hospitals or whatever X amount of schools or X amount of um, you know community agencies. So really within those parameters and limitations that we're trying to work everything together. Um, but what's most important too about your match and your assignment is what the focus is of your first year. Because when we're talking about foundational skills, we're really talking about what is the work in person and environment? What is the work with individuals and families and working in the community? And then really getting into sort of the direct practice aspect of things. How can you sort of brush up on your skills, learn your skills when it comes to working with individuals and families, learning from your supervisor and the other staff that are at the organization so that the community work and all of that that you're gaining is going to be transferable to your next either field placement or again to your career. This program with field is really about scaffolding those skills because we want you to be able to gain them, learn them, be able to interface with the community, be able to learn and find your voice and supervision because reflective super supervision is gonna be such a key aspect, particularly in your second year learning. But a lot of the task oriented or case management all of those things are coming to the fore when it's about your foundational skills. So as we're sort of leaning into the direct practice uh, aspects of social work, and then again, that being concurrent to what you're learning in the classroom um, in 301 and 300 classes, which are sort of your intro to micro and macro practices, 
we're really looking at how do we integrate all of these different aspects that you're learning in the classroom, apply them to the community so that you can have firsthand practice, um, and then talk about them in those classes, talk about them in the seminar so that all of that work is integrated and you're looking at it from the lens of you have all of these different levels of social work that you're looking to um, be involved in and looking to impact and be able to ultimately move across all of those different sections and levels pretty seamlessly. Um, and that aspect of it, because the macro part of things isn't necessarily the focus uh, in your first year placement, we do apply a project and we want students in their first year to be able to do a little bit of a deep dive with their assigned agency about what are some of the macro aspects? What are some of the policy aspects, organizational um, that are hitting the organization? And how can you look at it critically to think about what are some of the ways that you're learning about how the um, organization fun functions from a macro level? Um, and then are there ways that you could um, have suggestions or ways that you can look at things differently or uh, value add to the organization from your point of view. Um, but the macro project is really integrated into your first year practice because again, we want you to have a wide lens of all the different levels when it comes to micro, meso, and macro. And the macro project is going to fill that, um, that aspect of things. Mm -hmm. And the macro project too, I think for those who are more direct practice or clinically inclined is, is incredibly important, not only to look at the organizational, the organizational needs, policies, processes, but also um, in terms of like program development, right? So a lot of students who already know, right, that they want to be clinicians or therapists, um, or just more inclined towards the direct practice piece of the curriculum and of the field um, will create, you know, a nine week curriculum or they'll create a resource referral guide or they'll do a literature review on a particular intervention that they either want to learn more about or that they want to propose to administration at their organization. So we're really flexible in terms of what this project can look like with its intention to really be applicable, right? So, um, you know, this is a project that ideally you're going to be able to hand this off to your field instructor or to the agency, disseminate the information that you've learned. Um, because we know, right, that in social services and nonprofit organizations like that, oftentimes we're resource strapped, capacity strapped, um, and so this is really um, such a value add, I think, for our field agency partners, as well as for your learning on how to actually take a couple of steps back from what your your day to day looks like. And if you had extra time in the day or if other administrators within the organization had extra time in the day, what are some of the gaps in services or the needs, right, that this or that this project could potentially fill? Exactly. So let's talk about timeline, because that's important to this process, of course, because you're going to be wondering when does all of this go down? And like Susan talked about, uh, because you're an incoming student and some of you are advanced standing, so you're starting classes in the summer. Um, some of you are moving from out of state. Some of you are moving internationally. Some of you are um, looking for placement over the summer in terms of residence. And then uh, you start with uh, both orientation and classes in September. So what we're able to do is take away some of that legwork for you with this assignment, because as you come to the school and you're working through this in the summer and you're working in this and starting in September, we're gonna have your field placement already assigned for you. So that you won't have to worry about. But the process and when you're gonna find out about it typically happens in July or August because we're doing all of this on a rolling basis. Our committee meets regularly. We're looking at all the applications and the resumes and we're looking at maps and we're looking at our available placements and we're making phone calls and we're making sure that the matches are secure before we tell you all of the information. So as you're waiting and you're thinking about when am I gonna be placed and you're looking and you're, you're sort of concerned about I'm, I'm moving to Chicago, I don't know what, where to get my apartment. All of those things are we're sort of factoring in so that when we know all of that solid information, we can make that solid match. But we want you to know that 
at some point when you do hear uh, about your match and when you get assigned to it, you'll have the ability to interface with the supervisor. We want to encourage that meeting. So we can schedule a pre-placement meeting. We can talk about sort of what are some of the orientation things? What are some of the nuts and bolts when it comes to like commute and parking and um, getting my badge or doing any other prerequisite information stuff that the organization may need? We do make a connection after um, you are given the match. So just know that things are happening on a rolling basis. I can't tell you or we can't guarantee you that you're going to hear from us on July 1st or you're going to hear from us on August 8th. It's all on a rolling basis. And so um, that's pretty much how our summer is taken, taken up in terms of giving um, all of this time and energy to making sure we have the solid match and making sure you're connected to that field supervisor when it's all said and done. Absolutely. And this is where, you know, our field team said this is something that we definitely want to improve. So the previous matching process, you'd go to orientation and then you'd be told where your match was. Right. So there wasn't any sort of um, pre placement meeting. You, you know, previously were not meeting your field instructor. Um, or gathering any sort of information in terms of what onboarding um, might potentially look like, or even orientation to the organization. Um, and so our, our new matching process is really set up to make sure that some of those questions are already answered for you before you're really even moved to Chicago if you're relocating, before you've started orientation, before you're, you know, not having to start placement along with classes, but you haven't any idea of who your field instructor is or what you might be doing. So um, it's really an important piece, right? Once you are connected um, with your field instructor, with this agency to go ahead and schedule that virtual pre-meeting, uh, just so you have a better understanding of what might be expected of you as you make your transition in as a student. Um, and so, while the introduction is made, you know, late July or beginning of August, um, first year students typically are starting by that second week of autumn quarter. Um, if you are placed at an agency, if you've indicated on your field application that you have availability um, in August or September, we would call that an early start, right? And so there are some agencies that prefer to kind of do their onboarding and orientation and some, maybe some case management or like direct practice work um, before that second week of autumn. But if you're not available um, until you move here when classes start, uh, definitely put that on your field application, right? Um, our intention here is to really match you with the agency that best aligns with your interests first and foremost, but also we take into consider consideration your logistics. So if you can't get here until you know October or September, we certainly would not match you with an agency, right? That has an early start. So if there is an early start, you would, you would be, um, and if you've indicated that on your field application, and if you're matched to an, uh, an agency that requires an early start, then um, we will contact you and obviously let you know. If circumstances change, um, that's okay. Just let us know. Um, and then certainly that wouldn't be the best match for you. Um, so first and foremost, the majority of our first year students really do start um, definitely that sec week, second week of autumn quarter. Mm -hmm. September is really where you get a lot of nuts and bolts from us. So when we're doing orientation, we're going to be deep diving into sort of what are the days, what are the hours, what are the requirements in terms of our recruit uh, accrual, who's my field consultant, um, when are seminars, all of those that important data that isn't going to isn't as useful as right now, but will be in September. Um, is going to be given to you during orientation. And that's why, again, as Susan had stated, we start a little bit later, we start that sort of first or second week of October, so that students get their feet on the ground, get settled a little bit, and then um, enter into the field placement. Um, briefly, uh, some of the organizations that we work with, some of the partners that we have are written on this slide. Again, um, a lot more extensive um, when it comes to who are the sort of grassroots organizations that we work with here in the High Park neighborhood. 
other communities throughout the state. Um, we have such great relationships with these organizations. We continue uh, to vet new and prospect new organizations every single day. And we want these organizations to meet and live up to the requirements that and standards that we want. We want to make sure that the organizations and the partners that we work with have all of the learning opportunities that are going to sustain you over the 10 months, over the academic year. So, um, and this is just a little sample of who those folks are. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, as, as Mel said, we have, well, we have over 800 field agency partners, um, some of whom are large institutions, right? Like Chicago Public Schools, the logo that you see on this slide. But, you know, we also partner with really small grassroots community led nonprofits, particularly on the South and West side. And certainly for students who are interested in nonprofit management or more grassroots organizations, we have those partnerships as well. But if you are coming to Chicago too, and you're interested in studying in, you know, the third largest city in the United States, right? Um, we also have partnerships with those large hospital systems. You know, Mel, before coming into um, the field of field education, the field of field education, um, you know, he was the director of the social work department at Lurie's Children's Hospital, right? So we have a huge partnerships with all the really major local hospital systems here within the city. Um, a question that we get often is, do students receive stipends for first year field placements? Um, by and large, no, right? I don't think um, we are working towards partnering with agencies and encouraging agencies to provide a stipend wherever possible. Um, but I would say that the, the trend, the pattern that we are seeing is that second year field placements are more moving towards providing stipends, whereas first year placements, because the work is, is foundational, um, they uh, typically do not provide um, a stipend. Now, they're rare, they're at the discretion of the agency, but we, again, we are advocating for our field placement partners to be able to provide that stipend. Um, one thing though that I would like to note is that, and I think there's probably a slide on there, uh, this a little bit later in the presentation, is that if you are coming into the Crown School and you are locally based, or if you have an, a, let's say a nonprofit um, job em employer, right, that allows you to work remotely. Um, we are able to um, offer employment-based field placement. So what that means is if you are one of those students, please put that on your field application. Um, there is a, a piece there that you'll be able to select and we'll be able to follow up with you just to make sure that the experiences that you're getting at your current employment um, align with our sort of our, our council and social work education accreditation standards that we can count these field education hours um, towards. So again, um, it would be um, it it would be fair to expect that you wouldn't likely not receive um, a first year field placement stipend. Well, they're not required or that they're not uh, provided by the agency, uh, our program works locally and nationally on the paid for placement movement. And so uh, when we talk about um, what are the trends, what are some of the um, movement, uh, we are working with our uh, P4P chapter that's here at the school. Uh, we're working with other directors through consortium at other universities, and we're working on a national level when we go to conference to talk about these issues. And so it's very much at the forefront of our minds, and it's um, and uh, definitely looking to continue to build on that and, um, and follow those trends so that we can be partnering right side by side when uh, the movement continues to grow. Um, and then that you know, sort of when it comes to the hour requirements, when it comes to, and again, uh, we'll talk about a lot of this during orientation, but just so you know, um, now and at the top of your head, you'll be in placement two days a week uh, if you are um, a full-time student. For advanced standing, I um, mean, you're completing this program in one year, um, you're typically three days a week because of um, the clinical work that's involved if you're, if you're doing clinical or on that path. Uh, for clinical work um, as an advanced standing student. But um, the way that it works with hours, because there's an hour accrual that's required through CSWE, which is our governing body when it comes to social work education, 
um, is that you need 480, which is a number that um, is accrued throughout your um, academic year and your first year. Um, and that amounts to 16 hours per week. So two days, eight hours each, those are eight hour full days. How you get to those 16 hours, how you get to that 480 could also be flexible because it could be a negotiation between you and the agency. You might have an alternative schedule, a different schedule that might not be um, where most students are landing. Um, there are, um, the way that that's designed is that you're in classes uh, on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So those two days are just dedicated to your field placement. Now, um, the hour accrual and what that means is that you're automatically getting those 16 hours a week if you're just dedicating committed to field placements on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, or Tuesdays and Thursdays. It doesn't mean that you need to have face-to-face -face hours. So we know at working at agencies and working for doing direct practice, we don't um, need you to count just the how many hours you're working with clients or participants. Um, this means your full day that you're dedicated to them, whether it's you're um, doing the interface uh, with clients or um, some of that downtime as well. There's staff meetings or there's documentation. All of those hours count. So as long as you're in placement um, every week um, and you're doing those two days, you're automatically accruing, which sets you on that path to be at 480 or beyond. Um, and this looks a little bit different for part-time day students. And I truly mean a little bit different, right? So your first year, you, you don't have field, but then your second year, because it's a three-year program, your second year, you then kind of go on that same schedule, right? So your second year will look, will be called your core placement. Um, and so you'll you know be in placement two days a week, um, just like full-time day students, right? 16 hours a week um, with the same uh, way that you can, can accrue those hours and you're finishing with 480 hours for the entire academic year. And then your third year, um, which is your concentration placement, that's when you're doing um, a couple more days a week, right? So it's typically Monday, Wednesday, Friday, um, clinical, clinical students typically are doing a little bit more, admin are doing between 16 to 24 hours. Um, but, you know, as um, Mel also referenced with advanced standing students, um, is that uh, advanced standing students um, have already done their core placement, right, in obtaining the BSW. And so you're coming in and you're doing um, the concentration placement. So you'll be expected to do the, the 16 to 24 hours, um, you know, total. So, um, right. yeah, and just like, with extended evening program, like Susan was saying, just a little bit different. Um, Michael, why don't we pass to you so you can talk about those e hours. Thank you, Mel, I appreciate that. Um, okay, and so extended evening program students complete a total of 400 minimum hours in their first year over a calendar year. Um, starting typically in that first week of October of uh, that first fall quarter, but going all the way through the summer, to the last week of September of the following year. For example, um, folks uh, in the core EEP cohort this year started October 2nd, 2023, and will continue with their field placement all the way through September 27th, 2024. Um, really the breakdown for that is eight hours per week for 50 weeks, uh, taking out a week for the winter break and a week for the spring break. Um, and the vast majority of extended program students um, are doing their placement during the work week. Uh, um, however, uh, we do have agency partners that will um, allow for some flexibility for folks uh, who need a little bit more non-traditional schedule. Um, it just really depends, again, on all of the uh, things that we talked about going to the field application, um, the logistics, where you're living, the geography, um, the interest, students have and population they want to work with, and of course, the availability of our field agency partners to support uh, a specific schedule need. So uh, yeah, I really look forward to connecting with first year EEP students once they get your field application about finding the right fit, the right match for you. Thanks, Michael. Next, where are placements? Are they just in the city? Absolutely not. We have placements that are all over, but mostly in the city. <laughs> um, a lot of them are in the north side. Uh, we have agencies around um, here on the south side, 
uh, a west side as well. Um, and it's just really important to know, just in terms of when we look at neighborhoods, when we look at sort of what's out um, out in the community, when we're reaching out to organizations and organizations are reaching out to us, because organizations all are all over the map and want to partner with our school when they're in when they're taking interns, social work interns, um, we're able to really be um, in suburbs. We're able to be far north, far south, just because we have a smattering of those organizations that really want to partner us, partner with us. Um, but when it comes to just sort of really condensing things, and when we look at the map and we start to look at our database and and really look into sort of where are most of the agencies located. You'll see a, a cluster of them are mainly on the north side of Chicago, and the north side of Chicago usually means like the median line of like downtown ish to up north as far as Rogers Park. Um, if you're familiar with if you're familiar with the city, if you're familiar with Chicago, um, a lot of those areas again are where we have clusters of our field placements and our partners. All of these placements are accessible by uh, by transport public transportation. So again, if you're if you if you are living in Chicago or familiar with Chicago, you know the CTA line um, and familiar with it. Um, our placements are accessible through public public transportation, whether it's bus or train. So when you're looking at and thinking about commute, again, if you live here, you just know right off the bat, it takes an hour to get anywhere. Um, whether you're driving or commuting, hour is kind of our standard and our sort of barometer or where we want to keep your traveling um, in check, right? Because a lot of placements, sure, if there's an, a hospital on Evans, in Evanston, Illinois, which is just north of Rogers Park, um, or further down south, which is a little bit, um, which is, or further out west, which is a little bit further, like Oak Park, some of those neighborhoods or suburbs, um, if those matches match your interests and it, we'll check in with you and say, hey, we know that you have a car. We found a match that really matches and aligns with your goals in Oak Park. But the travel distance that we're mapping during the busiest time of commute in the morning and in the evening when we're mapping everything out is about an hour and 20. Are you down? Is that frustrating for you? Is that going to be difficult? Or are you open to it, right? And then a lot of the considerations are, that after it's sort of post pandemic world, a lot of our organizations are working in a hybrid setting. So there may be days that are dedicated to just in person, or there may be days that are just dedicated to um, working remotely. And so some those are some of the things that we'll be able to provide for you when it comes to matching with your organization so that if you are part of that sort of little bit longer commute, um, it may only be one day a week if the other day is hybrid at your organization. Yeah, that's great. Um, and obviously we spent the bulk of this time talking about your first year core field placement, right? And it makes sense. You'll be coming in and most of you all will be coming in as full-time day students. Um, but we also wanted to tell you a little bit about what to expect for the following year. So how are concentration or second year field placement mat, um, made, right? How are those matches made? Well, it's not a match process, right? So, um, and the advanced standing students are in this process right now. Um, you're working with the field office. The field office is offering different webinars and workshops. Um, but this process does mirror a traditional job search process, right? So you are looking in our database. Again, our database has over 800 agency partners. Um, you're selecting the ones that you that most interest you. Um, you're doing some maybe research on your own, Googling some of these agencies. You know, I know that I'd want to see kind of like what um, values and how the organization itself talks about the work that they do. Um, you would select, you know, three to four agencies that you'd want to apply for, you know, send your cover letter resume, and then actually go through an interviewing process. Again, this is not what you would be doing your first year. This is your second year internship. But, um, you know, a lot of folks, a lot of folks um, really like the matching process, right? Because we we listen to you know what your interests are, and then we already provide that connection with an agency. And a lot of folks really want the experience, right, of um, 
looking at all the different placements, um, applying for interviewing, you know, with a, a, a bunch of agencies and then making, you know, the choice, the decision on your own. This entire process, including the decision, including the negotiation process with getting likely multiple offers from many different field placement options is all part of the support that you'll receive um, from your from us at the field office, as well as some of your field consultants who during seminar will make space and time for talking about, you know, how is this process going for you? Um, and then lastly, I mentioned, right, um, this whole employment-based placement. Um, and so our accrediting body, CSWE, um, says that if you have an uh, employment already in a nonprofit or 501c3, we can utilize your current work situation as uh, the, towards the required number of field hours. Um, so um, again, if you have that, make sure that you indicate it on the field application. Um, then we'll um, walk through this process individually with y'all, which will essentially be just the completion of um, like a, a one or two page uh, document that we need to keep on file here to ensure that your field instructor uh, meets kind of the, the requirements of um, supervision as well as um, meet some of the expectations that we have in terms of social work competencies based on sort of what your job um, sort of has tasked you with or what the position description entails. All right, so we covered a lot and we want to be able to get to uh, your questions so we can open it up for Q&A. Um, many of you have already met or spoke with Melissa Williams, who is our field coordinator overseeing our first year uh, process. She's working with our advanced standing students. She's really in the front lines when it comes to our committee and all of that work. And so um, if Melissa, if you're still there, if you want to do the recap so we can bring it back to the recap of the timeline and what students to expect uh, when they um, come on into the program. All right. Thank you, Mal. Yeah. And so if you do accept your offer, you will get sent a link by our admissions team, um, a link to fill out the field application. You'll complete this field application like um, the team has stated. We encourage you to complete it as soon as you receive it. Make sure that you share with us uh, your interest, what population are you interested in working with, settings. Those are things that the committee will continue to take into consideration as we're doing or choosing your match over the summer. So you complete your field application and then you just wait until you hear back um, from the field team. You will be hearing back around uh, the end of July, early August, introducing you to your uh, field placement match. At that point, I will encourage you to set up a meeting to meet with the your new field instructor, learn more about the agency that you were matched with and start your onboarding process. And then you'll start your field placement um, uh, the first week of October, unless you have shared that you are available for an earlier start. So that's a little bit about that first year um, field placement process. And if at any point you have any questions or anything has changed in your field application, for example, if you thought you were going to live in Hyde Park and now you're going to live in Rogers Park, that's a huge difference. And we want to make sure that we're aware of those changes. So make sure that you're emailing me if there's any big changes that you think will make an impact on the matching process. And we did it. We've got through the information that's important to you now and field is always gonna be a part of your experience and your journey here, which will always be transparent about our communication and preparations when it comes to um, supporting you on this journey. But for now, we want to take your questions. There's a few in the chat that we can just take live, um, but definitely uh, either raise your hand or you know open up and unmute if you want to ask your questions. But why don't we take the first one from Bella. Susan, you want to take that one? Yeah, so Bella's wondering, do students ever stay with their first year placement for their second year concentration? Yes, <laughs> I would say that it is a mi minority, right? Like I would say maybe five to 10% even of students are kind of doing that. Um, we, of course, consult with students individually, just kind of weighing the pros and cons of that. Um, a lot of folks will want to do that and um, because it might, you know, open them up to the likelihood of future employment. Um, 
we we do have different expectations for first and second year, kind of like the tasks and responsibilities that you would be doing. Um, and so what we would do is you wouldn't be able to keep the learning agreement the same from your first year to your second year, but instead you would work with our field consultants to ensure that there is um, a pathway, that there is growth towards your learning of social work competencies. So for example, in your first year, and I think there's another question here that kind of alludes to like one or yeah, what are the general expectations maybe in terms of uh, contribution versus observation, things like that. Um, but in your first year, you know, you certainly would be doing m more observation, more shadowing, um, definitely case management. So there is direct practice also involved. Um, and, you know, it would be a very rare circumstance that you would be given sort of a caseload, right, like that third or fourth week, you would certainly be doing a lot of observing and shadowing of your field instructor um, before, you know, getting a caseload. Mm -hmm. uh, Caitlin's question is in regards to what are the general expectations for agencies, um, with agencies for students, especially in the first few weeks. I mean, certainly orientation, orientation orientation. We want our agencies to orient you to the program. And what that means is what are the nuts and bolts of this organization? Who are the staff? Who is your team? Who is your supervisor? How do things work around here? Where do I find things? That's really key to your first few weeks because you want to be able to be embedded into this program. You're going to be interning there for the academic year. You want to know who the players are. We encourage all of our agencies to do a welcome for our students, show students where their office is or where their workspace is, introduce them to their immediate team, um, be part of the picture, be part of the team when it comes to um, coming into a new organization, just like an organization would onboard and hire new staff. We want students to be able to be embedded. So I would say few, the first few weeks are sort of um, getting embedded into the program. But you're also starting to talk with your supervisor about your learning agreement. And that's going to be about what is the learning going to look like for me? Because it's not one size fits all. It might involve shadowing. It might be throw me in, let me do some stuff, you observe me, and then we learn from there. The learning um, agreement is really critical in your first few weeks because you're talking with the agency about what the expectations are and how is your learning going to scaffold throughout the year. You might, if you're going to be working with directly with clients, you might want to know when is that going to happen or when you might feel comfortable. All of those are sort of moving, moving targets and different per individual. So a lot of the orientation, onboarding, and putting together a learning agreement is what's happening in your first few weeks when it comes to starting an organization. Um, Jordan's talking about the list of agencies um, that somewhere that you can look at before filling out the first year. Um, I wish it's just so extensive, Jordan. It's a really, but we have a huge database. Um, I think we might have a list of agencies that are there um, on our webpage, but certainly uh, when you do a search of the types of organizations and social work, there's a good chance that they're partners with us. Um, so again, because of our partnership being so extensive, um, we don't really have one place where it all lives unless it's our internal database system. Um, which you won't just have access to yet um, as an incoming student. Certainly you will be once things start in September, October, but we need you to do your questionnaire before all of that. So um, um, certainly if you have direct questions about um, what are some different types of placements, we can answer that as well. And I think that you will have access to the database, correct? As Good. they will have the opportunity to look at the database. I mean, you'll see which mm -hmm. agencies do offer first year field placement, but I would just give you some caution on that, just because while our agencies may say that they host first year students, that is not always the case every single year as their needs change as well. So even if you do see it on the database, it may be the case that they will not be accepting um, intern staff that year, but definitely you get at least a sense of what type of experience or tasks you could potentially be doing in different agencies. And so if you do get the opportunity to look at, at, at that, um, you can share with us a couple of those that interest you. And while it might not be the one that we match you to, we might have other agencies that have shared interest in hosting first year students that their work may, may align with the ones that you have shared with us. Yeah. Um, and then Aaliyah conveniently put a link up there so that you all can see some of those organizations as well. Thanks, Aaliyah. 
Uh, Melissa Bell asks about um, they're already accepted uh, and, uh, and took the offer for admission. When should they receive the form? Elliot, do you remember when uh, students received that? I think, was it in June? It was, yeah, I think mid-May to early June was is the goal, kind of depending on what, you know, finishing up the, the, the academic year we're currently in. So, yeah, I think by June, maybe a little bit earlier. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Michael, you want to take Molly's question? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, are there types of faith agencies that are generally not available to first year students? <clears throat> yeah, I think some um, of the more traditional clinical settings um, are typically not available to first year students. Um, think about uh, hospital settings can be a challenge for first year students. Um, uh, private practice, um, uh, kind of like what Mel said, where um, you're essentially assigned a caseload um, and then outside of supervision and consultation uh, with your field instructor and your colleagues, um, you're just you're rolling with your client list. And so um, those settings do uh, uh, typically require folks to have completed um, a portion, their, their core field work and potentially a portion of their concentration field work. Um, uh, but it, it's really, I think, um, up to field instructor and the student um, uh, to make an informed decision about what these specific task folks are doing. Um, from like Mo said, uh, starting with orientation through the, the middle of their first year, um, uh, through the end uh, uh, of their time at Crown at the end of their concentration year. And so hopefully there's a build. Um, and for sure, there are greater opportunities for field placement um, in your concentration year. Uh, it just really depends on your interests, what happens to be available, um, or, how agencies are able to support students from year to year uh, varies a bit. And so uh, uh, that's where I think the field office can really be your ally and um, collecting a lot of that information ahead of time for you all and, and letting uh, you know where opportunities um, for the type of work that you want to be doing are and using our connections and relationships with our field agency partners to help put you in a position to um, be accepted you know, for those internship opportunities when uh, they're available. Yeah. And again, you know, when it comes to sort of um, the types of placements that are available for first year, I mean, again, these are organizations, we don't make that determination. So organizations are the ones who say, we take first year students, we only take second year students, or we take both. So um, a lot of that determination is about the learning objectives that Michael was talking about when you talk about sort of group practices, prior practices, most hospitals. Um, those eight, those organizations usually take only second year students, so those wouldn't be available to first year students. Um, and so when it comes to, you know, pathways, when it comes to sort of the areas that you want to focus on in your second year, we'll have agencies and organizations that map to that. And so again, those won't typically be available to first year. Um, I wish, Alexander, we can tell you where and where we suggest that neighborhood you should live. There's really... Uh, I mean, just because everything's accessible by um, train, we don't really have a solid recommendation of where you want to live. It's going to be so many factors that are nuanced for you for where you're going to live, but we can talk about mostly, right? And, 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 and admissions can correct me if I'm wrong, but most students are around the High Park area, around the school when they move here, right? Because, um, you know, whether they're sharing housing, there's a lot of housing that's available in this area. And again, you're mostly in classes than you are in field in your first year. So um, if you are sort of flexible and you're renting, um, then there are many students who, when they go into their second year or their pathway sort of concentration uh, field placement in their second year, will um, secure that first and then plan to move closer to that placement in their second year. So I'm not saying that's the way to do it. I'm not saying that this is what's um, required. I can just say that's sort of what's typical. So really focus on just sort of where you want to, um, what's gonna be, you know, when it comes to like, is it, are you looking for what's more affordable, where you're gonna be able to find roommates if you're gonna have roommates, focus on where you wanna sort of hunker down first. And then again, field will um, will sort of adapt to that. Yeah, um, and I think Caitlin's most recent question also kind of, uh, uh, you know, is similar, right? Is 
I think the travel infrastructure, public transportation here is pretty good. It's Chicago, so we are very much used to snow, sleet, hail, uh, any kind of pre precipitation that wants to, you know, drop from the sky. Like I think our public transportation is really great. Um, Jada, I did want to answer your question though. Um, I think I, uh, so I, you know, you're wondering about sites or agencies that um, prioritize transformative justice and our abolition. Um, a lot of these placements um, are second year placements uh, because it's tied within a particular pathway or program of study called transforming justice. Um, but, you know, off the top of my head, I'm going to rattle off some. I can put it in the chat, but this is recorded. Um, but I was just going to suggest that you check out some of the work by like Illinois um, Justice Project, um, Illinois Prison Project, um, Metropolitan Peace Initiatives, um, Chicago Torture Justice Center, um, Marjorie Kovler, um, Torture uh, Survivors, Torture Survivors, um, and literally that's off the top of my head, but I do know that the database would be able to give far more than just that. Yeah. Um, Veda, sorry if I'm pronouncing them wrong. Veda, uh, yeah. So uh, if hospitals, so yes, there's definitely, so the question is, is there, if you're, if the end goal is to work in a hospital inpatient program, are there first year placements that would best set you up for that? Absolutely. I mean, um, First year placements, interestingly enough, if hospital is your end goal, isn't necessarily a hospital in your first year. Case management work lends itself really well in terms of developing transferable skills for hospital inpatient work because hospital inpatient work is actually sort of, you know, in, it's, it's case management work in the sense that you are working with that floor or that unit um, and, and, and working with uh, families or patients that are in vulnerable spaces, right? And so being able to sort of manage all of that on a unit, on a floor, you wanna be able to gain the skills that are case management related, um, that are working with person environment, that are working with individuals and families because that's what all hospital and patient social work is about. Now, you'll learn in a hospital setting about some of the more clinical leaning work that's gonna be around grief work, end of life, we have some placements that are in palliative care for first year, if that's something that you want to sort of enhance um, and add to your toolbox if you're going to do hospitals in your second year. Um, and there are some outpatient clinics that are doing hospital-based work or working medically, but not um, inpatient or connected to the hospital directly. So um, there's a lot of those first year placements that we have too that um, could lend itself well, but I will emphasize, and this is for any really feel placement. Um, if your end goal is X, you don't have to be an X in your first year. It's all about transferable skills. Um, and so that to us is really important to sort of highlight and focus on. Um, but uh, to answer that question specifically for Veda, yes, there's definitely an organization that'll set you up all for that. What else? I may have lost track where we're at. You covered Caitlin, Susan. Um, thanks, Ron for the input. Rachel, typically do placement sites correlate with academic breaks or is it something that you need to work out individually with your field supervisor? 1000% correlate with the breaks. We want organizations to follow our, uh, our educational calendar. And so we uh, emphasize that up front with our organizations. We let them know because they are pretty long breaks, especially that winter break and holiday break. Um, there are, some students who uh, would like to continue the learning and do the internship through those breaks, those are always negotiable. Um, you may be asked by the field agency or the supervisor if there are some, if you wanna be able to intern during um, some of that break or for all of it, it's entirely up to you, uh, but we encourage you to take your breaks. We encourage our agencies and our organizations to honor our breaks. Um, they're so important when you have classes, field, maybe some of you are working, some of you have all, you know, you some of you are caretakers at home. We need you to take your breaks uh, for your own self-care. And that's what we wanna be able to emphasize with our agencies as well. Um, Caitlin's also asking, can you talk with your agency about continuing work over the summer? Um, well, Caitlin, we want you to have your summer too. <laughs> 
<laughs> but certainly you can talk to them about it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it wouldn't necessarily count um, as your, in, you know, internship hours or your field placement hours. Um, a lot of field agencies, after working with our interns at the end of the academic year, might even offer a volunteer opportunity or even made a, a paid opportunity over the summer. So a lot of those can definitely transfer to those type of things. And you're certainly open to talk about that with the agencies if you're open to it. Just unfortunately, whatever those hours you complete outside of the requirement for the academic year over the summer won't count toward um, any of your overall hours needed to graduate from the program. Um, are we okay that we're over, Leah? Yeah, maybe this final question and then we can wrap it up just to be respect everyone's time, but yeah. Final question will be handled by Melissa Williams as I see it <laughs> as an advanced standing student. Okay, the question is, I'm an advanced standing student and have already interviewed at a field, a few agencies. Does the field agency know that we're supposed to start um, that first week of October at the internship, or is it something that we communicate with them on if they want us to start in the summer? Yeah, so most of our agencies should know that your field placement will start the second week of um, the quarter, but I definitely encourage you to give them just a friendly reminder just so that they know what the timeline is. And of course, talk to them about what their onboarding process is, because some of our agency partners may ask that you start earlier than that second week of autumn quarter. So my recommendation is always to communicate and, you know, ask them what their expectation is before you even accept an offer. And I think that is all. Look at that. Managed to, yeah, we went over, but it's that, okay. That's okay. <laughs> they were really good questions um, and you had really great responses. So thank you everyone for attending this afternoon. Thank you, Mel, Susan, Melissa, and Michael for um, presenting. It was, it was fantastic and I think really helpful for our um, incoming students. So and we have our final session tonight at six um, o'clock central time, a panel with our current students. They'll talk a little about their field placement as well as other things around um, life here at Crown. So we hope you can join us then, but in the meantime, have a great rest of your day. Thanks all. Appreciate you. Welcome again. Take care.